Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our town hall meeting. Today's topic is near and dear to all of us with low vision as we face our challenges with the right lamps, right lighting for all of us. We are thrilled to have um, Greg with us today to tell us all what we need to know about lighting. Um, Greg, and sorry, Greg, if I don't pronounce your name correctly, Guarnaccia, the founder and a principal designer of the International Light Studio, has been practicing lighting design for 30 years. He is involved with a variety of project types, from mid-rise commercial and residential to mixed use, schools, hospitality, and cultural centers. Greg is the current chair of the IES, Technical Committee Lighting for the Aged and Partially Sighted, and a member of the NIBS Low Vision Design Committee. He also represents the IES on the ANSI CCA 117.1 Accessibility Standard Committee, he is lighting certified by the National Council on Qualifications for the Lighting Professions and is a lead accre accredited professional. And I am also thrilled to say that Greg is our lighting designer for our um, newly renovated, which is under renovation now, POB Low Vision Center in Washington, DC. So you can try out all the designs, the lighting designs when the building is finished and you can see Greg's work over there. Greg, the mic and the screen are yours. Thank you very much. Now, now the pressure is really on for the design of the office. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent, all right. I appreciate that introduction um, and always happy to be here. Um, I have uh, a, a lot of things to, to discuss, um, and I've kind of divided up this presentation to um, first touching on, I, I guess, an acknowledgement of what the problems are, the issues are that um, everyone on this call is is concerned about. So I, I, I don't want to preach to the choir too much, but I, I think it's important to um, acknowledge them within the context that I would look at this um, issue of low vision in design as a practitioner. So you sort of have an understanding of what we look at when we see a space and how we assess a space and how we deal with this particularly challenging topic. Um, and I'll, I'll start going through this. I do have a lot of slides, so. Um, so let's just start with that, that first pass and sort of acknowledging and understanding what the issues are, because as practitioners, um, we saw problems. The, the designer, whether it's an interior designer or me as a lighting designer or an architect, we, we have to understand the problem in order to try to find a solution for the problem. And the real challenge with vision related issues, whether that's again with lighting or simply mobility or anything like that, is that it is not a consistent thing that we can pin down for everybody. Everybody's experience is different. You could have the exact same uh, conditions that the next person does, but their experience with those conditions is entirely different. Um, so it is a very, very challenging topic, um, more so with lighting than any other uh, particular discipline but it is a very challenging topic for us to, uh, to tackle because there is no single solution. So the first thing we do is we have to look at how we can distill down the challenges into something that's actionable, things that we can actually try to solve for. Um, and those things become maybe a little bit easier in some ways to solve in a residential condition where it's just your space um, but most of the time we're dealing with commercial applications or even say continuing care communities where you're dealing with 
the variety of people and ailments that um, have to um, uh, navigate those spaces and deal with those spaces. And that becomes a, a real challenge. So we try to distill this down. So the first thing we look at when it comes to vision related issues are the natural age related vision issues that everybody is going to experience to some degree, right? There is a reduction in certain photoreceptors or rods as, as we get older, we lose some of our rods and uh, our rods are specifically geared to helping us uh, in low light conditions. Right, they're monochromatic. It's not how we see color, but in very, very dark environments, our rods give us the ability um, to see some level of of, uh, of something in that environment. Those are responsible for our very low level uh, uh, lighting vision, and so we lose those. Unfortunately, um, it seems like a very critical element. Right, um, this would apply to say, you know, waking up in a darkened bedroom in the evening and uh, with no lights on and so your your rods are activated and if you're obvious if you're losing um, or getting a reduction in the amount of rods your vision is getting compromised there um our lens hardens um this is why we need glasses for to read or uh other thing, uh, uh or or to see far for example um you know i'm nearsighted but i also have to constantly take my glasses on and off uh in the last five or ten years because my vision has changed enough just from the lens hardening that my lens does not have the dynamic flexibility to focus at enough different uh, visual ranges for me just to keep my glasses on all the time or, or not use them as all. Um, so there's a, a, a focal um, issue that we have to deal with there. Um, our lens yellows. So the lens of your eye actually changes color and it starts to get a little yellow it's called opacification. Uh, and as you can imagine, that's like putting on a pair of yellow sunglasses. Um, and I'm sure that everybody has put on a pair of colored sunglasses at some time for a party in their lives. And you know what that does to your vision. It distorts your view of, of everything. Um, things become uh, less detailed, monochromatic. Um, you can't make distinctions between certain colors. Uh, and so with the opacification that we have, our lens actually, this yellowing, is filtering out blue wavelengths uh, of light. And that becomes uh, a problem, not just for the distinction of contrast between colors and surfaces, but also for our, our biological rhythm, our circadian rhythm. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Um, the dynamic range of our pupil, as you know, it typically in darker environments would uh, open up, allow more light in, brighter environments that would close to uh, reduce the amount of light, that dynamic range gets reduced as we get older. Uh, in addition, we also get increased number of floaters. Um, those are little vitreous clumps in our eyes. Uh, and uh, often you can see them when you're sort of looking into a, a bright light and in your peripheral vision, you see these little amoeba-like forms that are, are kind of floating in your vision. Um, and they seem kind of uh, mundane and, and not really all that important, maybe a little bit of a nuisance, but they are actually very uh, uh, important because they increase our susceptibility to glare. Uh, they refract the light that's coming into our eyes and create a greater, uh, greater instances of uh, glare. So it makes us much more susceptible to glare. And the best example that I give to that, uh, particularly to uh, my students who are, are much younger, um, is that if you're, for example, you're driving at night in rainy weather and you have raindrops in the air as well as your, your windshield and when you see an oncoming car coming with its headlights, the glare is, is far more magnified in that condition than if you were on uh, a, a beautiful evening um, where there was no rain. Right? And the condition is very, very different. And this is what's happening uh, in your eye with floaters. Uh, and dark adaptation uh, slows down. So our ability to adapt to different intensities within an environment. So going from a bright environment to a dark environment or a dark environment to a bright environment, the dynamic range of your adaptation as well as the rate of that adaptation slows down tremendously. So where a young person of 20 years old may be able to adapt from a scale of zero to 100, 
an older person may only really adapt, have a dynamic range of 30 to 70 percent, for example. So that range gets much smaller and it takes a lot longer for your eyes to adapt. So those all become challenges as we navigate interior environments where you might have windows in one room and have a very bright experience and all of a sudden go into another room, like a bathroom or a kitchen where there is no window. And all of a sudden the light levels drop by 50%. And how do your eyes react to that? What kind of uh, uh, condition does that create for you? And it's, it's a very, very difficult uh, situation, particularly in small residential environments where you're moving from space to space very quickly. Um, so what do these things have uh, in common? Well, um, let me get back to that in a second. Um, the other element that I wanna make a point to bring up too is that we also have eye diseases that we're all susceptible to. And these are compounding elements that I'm sure you're, you're I know you're all aware of. I'm not going to spend too much time talking about each one of these, but you know, cataracts, glaucoma, retinal detachment, AMD, diabetic retino uh, retinopathy, retinitis pigmentosa, all of these things compromise our vision, either robbing our visual field, uh, the clarity of our vision, increasing the floaters in our vision, on top of all of these natural age-related uh, elements. And so this is a, a, a real big compounding problem that is happening to everybody to a different degree, a different rate of change over time. So this is why everybody is experiencing vision problems uh, with potentially even the same kind of problems as the person next to you in a different rate. Um, so going back to this slide here, as a designer, how do we distill all of this down into actionable items? It is very difficult. But what we do know from looking at those common natural age-related issues versus the compounding um, disease-related issues is that we have three things that we as practitioners and, and you in your home and other places can look at uh, to create some kind of intervention. The first one is that we have a reduced amount of light entering, right? All of those things that I talked about, about the dynamic range of your pupil, even opacification, um, uh, reduction of rods, um, all your adaptation, all of that means that there's a reduced amount of light entering the eye. So we know we need more light in general to see uh, what it was we may be able to see you know, better 20 years ago or 30 years ago to a more acceptable level of visual acuity. The second thing that we, we know that we can sort of draw a conclusion to is an increased amount of light scatter in the eye, be it direct uh, glare or reflected glare. We're so much more susceptible to this perception of glare. Uh, I think I will talk about what some of those things mean, but both direct from a surface like a, like a light fixture. Um, uh, again, thinking of those oncoming car headlights uh, at night in the rain or reflected glare off of another surface, like a mirror or a polished surface, much more susceptible to that. And then there's this reduction uh, of blue wavelengths of light, meaning our circadian rhythm is compromised and our color perception is compromised. So there are many other factors around these three things that uh, are a result of these natural age-related issues and the, and the disease-related compounding issues. But these are at least three actionable items that you can start to view your environments in and think about how you might be able to improve that environment for your visual needs um, and how that might play out in your space. And uh, I, I know I don't, again, I know I'm preaching to the choir in many cases, um, but some of the things that we, we really need to take in consideration of why this is important is because of physical things, right? And when you look at the 10 leading causes of non-fatal emergency room visits, um, unintentional falls is number one. 28.9% of these non-fatal emergency room visits uh, are from unintentional falls, far greater than anything else, far greater than getting struck by a vehicle or for um, overexertion um, or getting cut by something or bit, bit or sting, stung by, by uh, an animal or something. Um, it, it is a tremendous difference uh, by, from any of these other elements. So unintentional falls 
are by and large a result of a vision issue, right? You may have a mobility issue already, but generally the vision problem is the instigation for a circumstance by which your mobility issue might create a condition where you can't support yourself and you might fall, right? Simply say expecting or not expecting a level change, right? Visually, you, you, you may not see a small level change, a step, or you may think there is one, which is equally as dangerous. And therefore you may take an odd step there. And for uh, a very healthy 20 year old person, that may not be a big deal. You can write yourself, but somebody who has um, a mobility issue may not be able to overcome that small little misstep. And so that all starts with the vision problem of not being able to identify the circumstance that has created that. Um, simply not being able to read things like the directions on a medicine bottle or being able to see things on the store shelves. Um, reading signage. Um, this is a big problem in, in multifamily and commercial environments. Um, how does anybody in an environment that they don't regularly visit um, navigate all the signs in this picture on the right-hand side of the screen during an emergency when you need them, right? When the fire alarms are going off or there's smoke or there's panic, how does somebody with a vision impairment be able to read and distill information like that? This is virtually impossible. Um, but this also applies to your own home. And again, being able to see the things that you need to be able to see. Um, we also know that there are psychological effects. Um, it's very easy as somebody uh, experiencing vision loss to understand the physical process of not being able to read something, not being able to identify something. But you also have to understand that there are physiological effects such as impaired concentration and learning, pain perception, decreased productivity, depression, all of these things linked to a quality of life issue um, that we want to try and mitigate as much as possible. Um, other physiological effects are circadian disruption. Uh, this is something that's been talked about a lot in the last, say, 10 years. I'm pretty sure you probably all have heard something about this because this is uh, the neuroscience of this in the last 10 years has exploded in a way that has redefined the lighting industry, both on the manufacturing side and the design side. And circadian disruption um, from this opacification or yellowing of your lens has led toward uh, um, higher stress, poor sleep, my poor sleep leads to a lot of things. Um, when we were younger and all in school, we could all stay up all night to write that book report that we had to, and we're a little tired the next day, and it was no big deal. These days, if you don't get a good night's sleep, it really has a tremendous impact on your ability to, on your executive functions, on your ability to think clearly, on your ability to perform simple tasks, and it's, and it's very, very problematic. It leads to higher stress, increased anxiety, depression, um, uh, increased smoking if you're a smoker, cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, and even higher instances of breast and prostate cancer. Um, and I always highlight the last two uh, um, studies that were done in the early 2000s because they were the instigation for the World Health Organization to label shift work a probable carcinogen, which I find astonishing. So right up there with the exposure to chemicals, you have somebody working an overnight shift, that shift work is considered a probable carcinogen just because of the impact on your biological system that that has. And that's a tremendous, tremendous thing to acknowledge. Um, and we all have to recognize how much more susceptible we are to this because these are the kind of things that creep up on us that we don't readily notice because this is not a physical thing that you're viewing. You're not seeing some distortion in your vision and saying, okay, I can't, I can't see something. I can't read that. I can't recognize that there's a, there's a, a step that my visual acuity is off. You are just creating a physiological problem that you're not realizing is getting worse because of your vision issues. So again, we come back to the same question what are these things that we can do to mitigate this? So I'll reiterate that we know we need more light to see in general. We need to mitigate the sensation of glare or the potential for glare that blinds us um, as we navigate a space. And we need to do something 
about this biologic issue of our circadian rhythm getting compromised from this opacification um, of our vision. Um, there is a study that I always like to bring up. This is not a new study. This is back again from the early 2000s. And I really love this study. Talk about this because it was such a simple intervention, a very simple intervention that had very specific, straightforward, defined results that really show us that these are small things that we can do to transform our environments for the betterment of our vision and our health. So this was done in the Netherlands. This was done in a, in a continuing care facility. This was back in the early 2000s. So this was before the advent or the, the broad adoption of LEDs and lighting. So this was back when everybody was using fluorescent and incandescent primarily. And so this, this uh, intervention was done where they looked at a couple of uh, group care facilities. They did the intervention in the common areas where people spent most of their day. So these are the spaces where people ate in, did activities in. So, you know, 80% of their time were, were spent in these spaces. And so they did this intervention by delivering a certain measured amount of light at the eye between 9 a.m. and 6 p.m. And so they uh, brought the light levels up and they did this all with fluorescent lighting. They brought the light levels up to 93 foot candles, which is pretty bright. Um, and they raised the color temperature to 4,000 degrees Kelvin. Color temperature is how we measure the perceived color of that light, whether it looks warm, um, like an incandescent uh, light bulb, or whether it looks bluer or colder. And so the higher the number, the more bluer it is, the more blue content it has. The standard incandescent bulb for reference, old school incandescent, incandescent bulbs, when you were still able to find them um, at your local Home Depot or Lowe's, were generally around 2,700 degrees Kelvin, roughly. Um, 3,000 degrees Kelvin is roughly a halogen bulb, so that gives you some reference. Um, so they increased from the standard 2,700 degrees Kelvin to 4,000 degrees Kelvin, which is more akin to what we might do in an office. Um, the placebo or control group in this other facility had the standard 27 foot candles and they had the standard 2,700 degree Kelvin lighting. So they increased the lighting from 27 foot candles to 93 foot candles. That's like three times the amount of light. And they increased the color temperature from pretty warm to a bit cooler. And they normalized everybody's melatonin by giving them a set dosage of melatonin one hour before bedtime so they could isolate these changes that would be created, potential changes that could be created just by this lighting intervention. And I'll reiterate that all they did was essentially um, change the, the, the fluorescent lighting in the space. They added some more general fluorescent lighting, changed the, changed the light bulbs. Basically, what they did was change the light bulbs. And what they found over the course of the study, I find to be very astonishing, considering the simplicity of what this was. Nightly restlessness was reduced by 9%. That's pretty decent, almost 10% of nightly restlessness. So that's your ability to, to be settled at night and stay in a deep sleep. Sleep onset latency, so how long it takes you to fall asleep, was reduced by 19%. Incredible significance there. Sleep duration increased by 6%, so not too shabby. People slept 6% longer. Cognitive deterioration was reduced by 5%. Depressive symptoms were reduced by 19%. Aggressive behavior was reduced by 9%. And the astounding result was they found that functional deterioration of dementia patients was reduced by 53%. That's like an unfathomable, astonishing number that is hard to wrap your, your head around. Um, that's, it. that's along the same percentage of positive impact that we're finding today that um, dementia patients um, have when they're taking a pro uh, an appropriate uh, medication regime. So the current effective medication regimes these days uh, on average can can reduce or slow down these functional deterioration of dementia patient in somewhere around 50%. Um, obviously changing uh, as 
their their condition um, changes as well. But to say that they were able to do that and any of these other um, improvements, wh whether it was the nightly restlessness at 9% or even the sleep duration, these are all significant improvements from just increasing the amount of light during the day and making it a little bluer during the day between 9 and 6, nine, 9 and 6 p.m. So that is an astonishing acknowledgement that there are some simple things that we can do just with lighting uh, alone to improve our health, let alone um, our, our vision and our visual acuity. Okay, um, I wanna deviate for just a second here to talk about some resources um, that, you, that you have or that practitioners may have. Um, some of these things are directly accessible by you. Um, some of them, I think, are just important for everybody to know that they exist. So if you ever have an interior designer come over um, or an architect uh, or your um, uh, work in a, uh, uh, an office where they may be doing renovations, just to know what resources there are. Um, so the first resource I just want to tell you about is the uh, Illuminating Engineering Society's Lighting for the Aged and Partially Sighted Committee, which is a committee that I currently chair. And we evaluate research um, from published research, um, evidence-based uh, results, as well as just the design practice of all of our members uh, to sort of better inform us. And we create a document called Recommended Practice Number 28. And we work with all of the Illuminating Engineering Society's committees uh, to understand from the, the, and there's a lot of committees that cover uh, um, subject matters from um, human health to, uh, to visual acuity, to other sort of technical aspects about specific facilities. And we work with all of them to create a document that helps guide practitioners to understand how to design environments for adults um, uh, older adults and those who are visually impaired. This guide is, is primarily geared toward practitioners. So lighting designers, architects, um, engineers, um, uh, um, or, uh, uh, interior designers. So, uh, but, it's, but it's also, I mean, it's certainly accessible to individuals, but it's got, mostly geared to design professionals, even owners and facility managers. I give talks at various conferences almost uh, annually there where there are a lot of owners and facility managers who are interested in this information. And it's also referenced by code and regulatory agencies. It addresses light levels, value contrast recommendations, reflectance values of surfaces, uh, and all kinds of lighting design environmental issues that affect older adults in the low vision population. Um, this is a document where it has both prescriptive uh, requirements as well as general recommendations for color of light, uh, color rendering ability, distribution patterns. So it gets very, very technical, um, but it is the, the primary and seminal document here in the US that talks about how to light a space, about any space and, in any facility, the right way to, uh, to support vision for not just somebody that has extreme visual impairment, but anybody who is getting older, which is, everybody in our population. Um, it is a pioneering document. It is a living document. We update uh, this all the time. We are about to issue uh, another update for it. Um, hopefully this year we are in the balloting process uh, and we are uh, bringing in more evidence-based research into this. Uh, and we will hopefully be releasing that pretty soon. We'll see a broader population that we've considered an emphasis on special considerations um, we've updated the light levels. Um, we have additional information about health, um, how all of this relates to uh, the lighting manufacturing being all LED these days. We've uh, added a design guide for applications uh, and, and much, much more. Um, so I won't, I won't dwell on this too much, but it's important to know that that information is out there for any professional doing anything for you in your home, office, or other environment. And they should have this document if they are designing any facility for, for any, well, really for anybody, anytime I would say, but at least if they know it's a facility for an older person or someone with vision impairment. This next one um, is really targeted at most of you as homeowners. 
This is the uh, RP, uh, the uh, same committee um, that I'm chair of at the IES, published this um, CG1, Consumer Guide Number 1, and serves as guidance for the average individual. So what that means is that we've tried to distill those elements in the technical documents down into more accessible and simplified non-technical language with examples and conversation that relate more toward personal environments. So your home uh, and other environments that, uh, that you would most likely frequent it, but mostly uh, revolving around a residential setting. And explains basic lighting concepts in this uh, simplified language, and it identifies common issues and provides some basic guidance. And you have to understand, you know, based on all the things that we talked about, about how different this is for everybody. There is no one solution for everybody, but this gives you a, a baseline, a guideline of looking at those three things that I talked about, the quantity of light, glare perception, and the uh, biological or circadian impact, and how we might start to make little interventions to help us in our, our everyday spaces. Now, for your benefit, I, I sent uh, in a copy of this. This is a free guide. Whereas the previous guide that I showed you, the professional guide, does does have a, a cost to it. This is a free guide that we created, and I sent a copy of it uh, in before this presentation. And so, should you want the copy, um, uh, uh, PBS can can send that out to you um, for you, so you can uh, have this to look at and reference um, for yourself. Um, Another uh, committee and, and document, which is also a professional document, but this one I wanna bring up for a different reason. This is the ICC, which is the International Code Council. The International Code Council is the organization that creates all of our building codes in our environment. And they create both residential and commercial building codes. And they are by far the most adopted set of codes around the country. They have a standard called the A117.1 standard for accessibility and usability of buildings and facilities. This is not lighting specific, but it is accessibility specific. So it encompasses both lighting and the physical environment um, and how you can make an environment more adaptable and uh, more accessible for anybody with any type, type of issue, whether it be a visual issue or a mobility issue. Um, to date, things like the ADA code have really only addressed mobility. And that is a problem because it's more than just mobility. It's compounded by visual problems. And so this particular committee is, is starting to address this. Um, it is referenced by the Fair Housing Act for compliance um, and most government facilities um, require compliance with this document and many projects that have government money that are involved, um, which is why the Fair Housing Act is involved in this. If, if you have a, pr a project like a continuing care facility that has government funding involved or tax credits, they often require compliance with this. This, even though this is a committee um, that people are invited that apply to and invited to join. So you have everybody on this committee from practitioners like me, architects, engineers, interior designers. There are also um, users. There are also um, manufacturers, contractors. Um, it's open to everybody. Um, you can even just be an interested party and uh, submit an application to join and be a voting member. But more importantly, this committee is open to the public. Our meetings are open to the public. And you can go on the International Code Council's website and look for the A117.1 committee, and you can get an invitation to attend the meetings. And I like to publicize this because this is an opportunity for you to be an advocate. If you are somebody who is inclined to do that, um, this is an opportunity where you might attend some meetings, um, get a, a read of what the schedule and the topics are, attend meetings, even participate in, in work groups and offer your opinion and suggestions. And you may not, you're not able to vote without being a committee member, but you can speak and you can advocate uh, and you can be part of that conversation to let the, the committee members know you as a user who is impacted 
um, by mobility or vision impairment, this is how you experience the environment. So I always encourage people to, to, to get involved. The process of, of all of these kinds of standards is a very difficult and frustrating process, but I always encourage people to participate whenever they can. It really helps the process. Okay. Um, uh, now I'm going to work through a little bit of what I call a design guide, but this is really just um, a quick overview of some of these opportunities in environments that I want to identify that relate to the, the three elements that uh, I just discussed, uh, the lighting levels in the space, glare susceptibility, uh, as well as the, the circadian issues. And some of the things that um, we can do to help ourselves. This is certainly not a complete list, but these are just some very, very important things. So some of the uh, things we're gonna look at, we're gonna look at value contrast, object placement, luminant contrast, and lighting placement. These are things to think about in your own spaces. Um, value contrast is simply the contrast between two surfaces. Right. So think about, say, your the molding around the doorway is one surface or your baseboard versus the walls. So what is the difference in, in color and reflectance value there? Object placement is exactly what it sounds like. Luminance contrast um, relates to value contrast. And that's how, how reflective, what the difference in reflectance is between two adjacent surfaces. So that could be your backsplash and your countertop or the wall and the floor. Um, and then there's lighting placement. So where you put lights uh, and what kinds of lights. Um, <clears throat> so I just, that is, this is what I just said. All right, so um, value contrast. Um, this is a great picture. I don't know if anybody has been to this museum, but this is the Calatrava in, in Milwaukee. Um, and it's a seminal museum of incredible architecture, um, but it is entirely unfriendly to anybody with a vision impairment. Why is it unfriendly? Because it has horrendous value contrast. There is no value contrast. Everything is white. The floors are reflective, shiny white. The walls are, are white. Uh, and you even have, I don't know if you, can, <laughs> if you can see this, but you have these incredible architectural structures, these, these beams and columns that come down from the ceiling to the floor, but then come along the floor at a raised height, creating a curb. And they're all the same color. Everything is white. There's, there's no differentiation. And you have lots of windows, lots of bright light and sunlight coming in here. And it is beautiful, but it is a walking minefield for anybody that has vision impairment. It is too easy to trip, to fall, to bump into something. Um, and even though this is an extreme example, this is what you have to think about in your, in your spaces when it comes to value contrast, right? What is the the safety or task function of your space. How does the contrast with the work surface and its background work or work against you? And you want to eliminate invisible obstacles by improving the contrast, right? To give yourself visual cues of where your surface is. That could be the walking surface, that could be a handrail, that could be a countertop surface. Um, and that could even be things like stairs. Level changes can be the most hazardous um, to a uh, visually impaired user. Or, as I noted before, the perception of a level change where there is not one is equally as difficult. Um, and so we call this the ghost effect, when there is no value contrast or too limited of a value contrast between two surfaces. This goes with just flat surfaces here is an example of what we call a deceptive surface. Um, now, these are very extreme examples, but I, I do this for a reason. Clearly, on the one on the left should go without consideration. This is a flat surface where they put these pavers in there that make it look like it's a three-dimensional surface. I don't know what this the purpose of doing this is other than to confuse the heck out of everybody, but that's entirely dangerous for somebody that has a vision impairment because it looks like you have you know, steps and all kinds of crazy little level changes. Uh, but you could also have what's a very common condition, such as the picture on the right, where you have a stairwell, but then you have this confusing pattern on the stair of all these different colored tiles um, that just you know, repeat all over the place and make it very, very difficult for you to, to notice these level changes or how, how much of a level change there are. 
This may hit home a little bit more. You see this in a lot of residential environments, right? Where you have, now in this case, I have carpeting on the stairs with extremely busy uh, patterns on them. But you can imagine that these stairs without any uh, carpet are equally as problematic because there is no distinction in either of those conditions to where that edge of that step is. It is very, very difficult for, for anyone, even with good vision, to be able to navigate a set of stairs um, that look like this. Uh, it, it is extremely, extremely dangerous. And that doesn't mean that necessarily you can't have good looking staircase or good looking environment. You just have to understand that you need more contrast and you need a reduction in confusing patterns so you can more uh, adeptly and quickly identify where the boundaries of things are. Now, here's an example. We'll start to look at um, other things, but also some solutions here. The picture on the left uh, is amazing. And you may notice this or you may not notice this, but you see this water feature on the left. The gray uh, surfaces to the right are actually steps that go down to the water. So you're walking along that plaza and not only is there no distinction between where the edges steps are, but there are steps that go down into a water feature. That's clearly not a destination where people are supposed to walk into, but it is very, very difficult to see that. Now, one step in a better direction is the picture in the middle there. Still not a great series of steps, but you see how they created a differentiation along the edge of the, of the step to at least show you where the edge of the step is. So now you can see with distinction where each one of the level changes are. And the picture on the far right gives us, you know, an extreme example of a detectable warning. It's not sexy looking, but it really does the job in showing you that there is an obstacle there. And sometimes we simply just need to do this in our own personal environments, find ways of creating detectable warnings. So even though we've seen it a hundred times, you know, every day for the last 20 years we've lived in some place, we sometimes still need that detectable warning just to remind us when we're in a rush and not thinking um, that that is still there. We can still have nice stairs with uh, a runner on them as long as we put a detectable strip along the nose of that stair that shows us that going up and down the stair where that stair is, that gives us a very distinct understanding of where those boundaries are. And here are just two pretty good examples of how that can work. Um, not to mention they could be non-slip surfaces and we can do other things. But um, I focus on stairs a lot just because this is where a lot of accidents uh, uh, often happen. I also want to point out that the picture on the right here um, does a very poor job with the handrail because the handrail is the same color as the wall. I see this all the time in commercial environments where architects want to have a really slick handrail that is the same color as the wall because they want it to visually disappear, which is entirely the opposite premise of having a handrail because you want to be able to see where it is and hold on to it. Um, so if you can't see it and can't find it, that's a little bit of a problem. Um, so having a handrail that is a contrasting color with the wall uh, is, is of paramount importance. Uh, transparent or reflective surfaces. Now, both of the, these are more commonly found in commercial environments, but I'll show you some pictures where they happen in residential environments. Um, vertical mirrors create optical illusions of space that doesn't exist uh, and are very dangerous. Um, and even transparent panels can create the impression that there is nothing there and it creates a hazard in and of itself. But both of those can also reflect light at different perspectives and create a sense of glare that blinds you from seeing what may be in front of them um, or that they are uh, uh, hiding something else behind them or even hiding themselves. Um, we see this with showers, right? It's, it's uh, again, very designed forward to have, you know, fancy glass showers with glass walls and glass doors, um, but to, to not be able to distinguish where that barrier is is a very real problem. Uh, and there are ways of doing this and, and giving yourself an opportunity to have visual cues that it is there. So there, are, you know, I'm not talking about completely uh, turning away from having 
good looking things and good design. There's a way of being accommodating and having accessible design. This can also translate to things like your Tupperware. I bet nobody ever thought about that. What about all those clear glass bowls and clear, clear Tupperware, right? So when you reach into a drawer and you go to, or a cabinet, you go to reach for that clear glass, or you glass, whatever it is that is stacked on top of each other, are you able to distinguish that there are smaller bowls in the big bowls or that they're one on top of stacked in a certain way? Um, it can be very, very difficult for, for someone to distinguish that. And that's a great way of pulling something out and knocking something else over. Um, and I always recommend that we simply do away with things like that. So with glass items, you can have glass doors, you can have a glass shower, you can have, as long as you put some sort of identifying markers to, to give you some distinction that there is a barrier there. And there's a lot of things you can do from um, frosting applications and patterns and uh, all kinds of decorative elements that you can add there that have artistic appeal to them but give you some distinction and definition. Um, the Tupperware, get, get rid of the clear things and get things that are colorful, that give you a good understanding of what you, of where they are and maybe even what you might use them for, um, so much more helpful. Um, here's another example of this mirror mirror thing, reflect the glare on polished surfaces. Um, this distorts the pathway and this is a problem with windows, skylights and, and uh, electric lighting in spaces. This picture is good because it shows you, you have a nice wood floor here that has a matte finish. However, the amount of light coming through the windows is so much that is creating bright spots and potential glare on the floor. So you need to be able to mitigate the intense daylight coming from windows in a way that doesn't create a lot of glare off surfaces. Uh, the other problem with this photo is that uh, they're using shears. Shears are a big no-no. Um, I would never recommend using shears on windows because all they do is create this big blob of bright surface. So now you've, you've taken all that daylight and sunlight that was coming in and you've made this entire curtain glow. And what that does is it creates a very large bright surface. So when you enter a room, you get this contrast problem where the things in front of you, in front of those walls and those windows look very dark and those windows look very bright because your eye is always going to adapt to the brightest thing in the room. Um, so I always advocate for different interventions from simply using shades or horizontal blinds where you can mitigate them and control them in different ways throughout the day based on the daylight and sunlight that's coming in. Using area rugs, um, obviously, you know, I mean, you can't do much about uh, and do any better than, than having a matte floor surface if you have a hard floor and you can't carpet every surface but you can put area rugs, you can put um, uh, opaque blinds and, and uh, things that you can actually change the positioning of um, to help you there. Uh, and then with electric lights, you just wanna make sure that you have a lot of different sources of light where no one source is too bright or in your eyes. Object placement, um, I'm not gonna go too much about this, but you wanna be consistent with where you put objects around your house. You want consistent repetitive placement of furniture objects um, in all types of spaces. Every bedroom should be organized the same. Um, all your spaces should have a logical arrangement. So it makes sense to you and your muscle memory is consistent as you work through um, your environment. Intuitive locations, consistent locations, highlighting destinations and delimiting boundaries are very important as you're navigating any space. Um, this, uh, this, uh, well, signage applies to commercial environments, anything that you need to see uh, from a calendar on a wall to, uh, uh, phone numbers on the refrigerator needs to be at a height that you're able to go up and kiss it. We call it kissable signage. If it is not at face level where you can walk right up to it without an obstacle, right? It is not at the right location for you. So you need to make sure that those are in the right place and that you have signage, you have uh, things that you need, again, calendars or, or other information of the right contrast. Um, dark on light surfaces, dark text on, on white paper or, or light text on dark paper, however, however that might be. Um, highly visible uh, markings. Um, color is great, so delineation of things. Um, so you can locate things even around your home. I would say, what about things like kitchen cabinets? Um, and where you have things. 
color coding the edge of a cabinet. So you know everything that has the yellow sticker on it are things like Tupperware and bowls. And everything that has a green sticker is going to be cups and glasses and, and things like that. Helping create uh, uh, an environment where you know that you you're always going to be able to identify certain certain surfaces and certain things. Um, this applies to also um, uh, how you might uh, um, delineate, say, threshold destinations in your um, home. Uh, the threshold uh, of uh, the bedroom versus the threshold of the bathroom using the uh, consistent colors and maybe making them more contrast the thresholds versus the surrounding walls. Little things like that make a big difference, um, particularly in commercial environments where you know if you know everything on level four is orange and everything level three is, is green, you know what level you're on all the time because you see those consistent colors like they do often in parking garages. Um, so it's easy to locate things and direct yourself to places. And with lighting, all of this translates consistency, responding to changing environments. So meaning you have to have control over all of your lights and you want to think about uh, quantity and quality. You want to make sure that you reduce the perception of glare. So there's not too much luminance entering the eye off of a reflected surface or off of uh, uh, directly from a fixture. Right. This picture shows the classic example of too much glare coming through windows. So if you have those shears in the window, this is what you experience, a dark foreground and a really bright background. Very dangerous. This lowers the quality of your environment. Um, you want to use low reflect reflectance materials where you can, except around uh, um, windows and other apertures. You want to keep the finishes matte, but light colored. So it broadens the reflection uh, of light in a controlled way. Um, so you want to always make sure you're controlling any direct sunlight coming through windows and other apertures, and you're controlling the lights in your space. Everything is on a dimmer. Everything can be can be dimmed or brightened at any time based on the time of day. You want to avoid things like um, very luminous light fixtures, particularly decorative fixtures that have glass shades so you can see the light bulbs inside, um, or track lights, spotlights that are shining in your eyes from certain perspectives. All of these things are very, very challenging. Any small source of light that is viewable um, is an increased risk of susceptibility to glare. Um, so you want to be careful of that. Sunlight, huge problem coming through windows. These two pictures are of the same space with sun coming through them from different times of day. So you see tremendous shadows on the one on the left because it's coming through a wall that has a decorative pattern on it. And on the right, it's coming through a different wall that has a very typical you know, curtain wall system with mullions, but also creating deep, deep shadows and very bright surfaces. We experience all of this in our homes. And so we have to have some mitigating element to be able to control that direct sunlight. Um, and usually that is something like a horizontal blind is particularly um, something very easy that you can, you can do, something inexpensive and something that is variable that you can adjust. Transition zones. Um, these are very important. In commercial environments, we create a large vestibule where we position and put the right amount of light so you can transition from a bright environment to a dark environment. At night, that inside is brighter than outside, and at, during the day, outside is brighter than inside. And so that vestibule becomes a transition zone. Well, you can do that in your own foyer. Think of your foyer or your mudroom um, as a transition zone. And you want to make sure that you have enough light in your foyer so when you come in from your, your walk on a bright summer day, the lights can be turned on and you can give yourself a few moments standing there to let your eyes transition and adapt to the lower light level. And then you can move on to the rest of your house, which would then presumably have a slightly lower level of light. And then you've given yourself uh, an opportunity to transition. And the same thing the other way around. Um, you want to be able to dim the lights in your foyer. So when you go outside to the darkened environment, you had an opportunity to stay in your foyer for a minute before you go outside uh, into a much darker environment at night. So transition zones are very popular. Um, this slide is just being careful not to create, again, dramatic um, differences in your home between very bright areas and very shadowed areas uh, because our eyes always adjust to the brighter area making the shadows even darker than they would normally appear and it makes obstacles disappear. So I'm an advocate of a lot of portable lighting, uh, particularly indirect lighting, 
Uh, again, using uh, physical um, value contrast. Here's an example of uh, painting thresholds, uh, certain colors that are uh, of a different uh, or higher contrast to the wall surface. So you know you've reached destination. Um, handrails are in contrast to the walls. There is a contrast between the floor and the wall. So you know where those boundaries are. Having uh, uh, that contrast there or even baseboards that are a darker color than the wall is very beneficial for you to navigate around your own home as well as uh, other environments. Okay, I know I've, I've talked very fast there because I know we're running out of time. Uh, so I wanna sort of wrap this up with just some resources and I can share these if anybody is, is uh, interested uh, of course, there's the I, IES uh, RP28 committee that I that I referenced. Um, there is uh, Lighting Your Way to Better Vision. This National Institute of Building Sciences um, has a, uh, a, a, um, a document as well here. Um, and there are other uh, guidelines as well. Um, here, I want to point out the designforsite.com website. This is by a colleague of mine, Erin Shamberek. Uh, she's an interior designer and created this website for people, mostly for interior designers, looking at understanding how to uh, uh, distill an environment with some of the low vision. But she goes through and uses these icons that I, I used in my presentation here to sort of identify what some of the challenges are from silhouetting and, and transition zones, uh, kissable signage, open borders, this, all those kind of things, and what some of the problems and the solutions are, very much like our consumer guide um, does. Okay, with like two minutes to spare. <laughs> um, uh, that is my presentation. Thank you very much. Um, I hope some of this was useful information. I know that was a great deal of information in a short amount of time. Greg, this was amazing. And a presentation packed with information um, I am glad we recorded it and we will share it with everyone. In addition to the document you have provided us. Um, so stay tuned for maybe tomorrow we can share with you that email. Um, but I would just like to um, like give some time for people if they have any questions. I know you can go through the presentation at your own pace. But if anyone has an urgent question that you would like to ask Greg, please do. Okay. It's, a, it's a large, complicated subject that's hard to even distill questions about. I, I it is, it. it is. And many things to think about, um, really, um, so with that. I do have a question. Go ahead. So if you just you, reflecting back on the very first um, study that you were showing, um, if you wanted to buy uh, lighting that has more blue light, that has, you know, the the characteristics you were describing, what would you look for? Where would you buy it? Yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent question. That's a challenge. Um, so all all lighting, including when you go to your standard, your typical Lowe's or Home Depot, buy light bulbs. Um, they're required typically on the back to have a label that tells you what the color temperature is. And that'll be listed in degrees Kelvin. So it generally doesn't go any lower than 2,700, but it can go up as high as 5,000. Um, so if you have light fixtures in your home that have replaceable bulbs, you can go and you can go to the store and look for one that has a little bit more blue content in it. Um, generally, I recommend that you, you don't go any higher than maybe 3,500 which is on the cool side of neutral, neutral or the 3,500 is really considered neutral, but it gives you a little bit more blue content. But the best thing you can do, the best thing you can do is get outside. That is the very best thing you can do is during the day, get outside, sit by a window, see, but understand that many windows have coatings on them. So the best thing you can do is, is get outside as it relates to that biological circadian disruption because that is the most complete light experience that you can have. Uh, and the reason why I say that is because at night, you don't want to be exposed to that, that extra blue light, right? You want to be able to go to sleep. You want to be exposed during the day when, when it's daylight. But you want to be careful that you don't want to raise the color temperature of your home. So your environment has always got extra blue light in it, disrupting your um your experience so i would caution you 
about doing that at home unless you set up a specific room for yourself where it's like that in case you can't get outside. Does that make sense? Uh, yes, but uh, it does raise another question, which is that many of us wear sunglasses outdoors to protect, you know, from UV. So is there a, an important distinction about what kind of sunglasses to wear? Yeah, most UV uh, uh, blocking sunglasses are not going to block the blue light of the light, so you're okay there. Um, if you put on yellow sunglasses, I know some people do that because it helps the clarity of their vision. That's a problem. The yellow tinted ones tend to be a problem, but the regular sunglasses that are just for, for UV or just to lower the light level a little bit, those those are not a problem. Just spend a just spend a little extra, take a, an extra lap around the block, um, you know, or take the long way to the supermarket, um, you know, hold hands with your husband a little bit longer as you walk down the street, whatever it may be. Give yourself just a little bit of extra time in that beautiful daylight. Hmm. Any other questions for Greg? I have a question. Go ahead, Evie. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, just want to be sure that you are POB, and thank you for this wonderful program. So helpful and interesting. Can will you have available information about the publications that were listed? There was a lot of information that was too fast for me to keep notes on. That are I, things that I. We would, I think, many of us want to pursue our own mm -hmm. investigations following yeah. his lead. It was wonderful. Uh, Greg, I think it was available in the document you sent me, correct? Uh, yes, yeah, so the document is the, is the primary document. And yeah. uh, I can always, of course, I can uh, email my last few slides. I, I'm happy to share the presentation, too. Um, and you can have those, those links right. there as well. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, if you could do that so we can put it all in one email and send it out to everyone. Sure, I would Thank be happy you. to. Mm -hmm. So any, I, yeah. oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, Greg. No, 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 please, any other last minute questions? Yeah, no, any last minute questions? Who would like to be the last one to ask? Okay, I guess we don't, Greg. So. Yeah, I'll just wrap it up by saying, that I encourage you all to take a very close look at not just your homes, but other environments that you may frequent and think about the things that we that we talked about today because it's equally important to become good at identifying what the problems are uh, and how they might be solved in all environments. This is what I teach my students to do, is experience all environments, being able to deconstruct what is giving you a problem in any environment? It could be the supermarket, it could be an office, it could be wherever. And think about how you might solve that solution and translate that to your own home when you see something something similar like that. Um, and I also uh, want to say that you can have you can never have too many light sources wherever you have a task. So make sure you have plenty of of lights around your home, um, particularly ones that are indirect that throw a light up onto walls and ceilings that you can turn on and off as the need arises to be able to vary your environment as, as much as possible. And I'm also a big advocate of dimmers on, on everything. Okay. Thank you very much, Greg, for today's presentation. It was enlightening <laughs> for mm -hmm. all of us. Um, and we will make sure to send all the information out as soon as possible. And thank you all for joining us today at our town hall meeting. Have a nice day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye.